Welkom bij de laatste aflevering van Spelbrekers, een vierdelige serie filosofische gesprekken over spel in het leven georganiseerd door de buren van Vlaams Nederlands Huis voor Cultuur en Debat. Today we will switch to English because of our esteemed guest Teresa. Um, I'm Fiep van Bodegom, writer and critic, and uh, moderating tonight from my home in Amsterdam. The Dutch historian Johan Huizinga introduced the concept of homo ludens in 1938 in his book with the complete title Homo Ludens, a, st a study of the play element in culture. In this study, he argues that play is the primary formative element in human culture. This is also the starting point for this series of conversations in which we focus on the play element in different domains of human life, namely art, politics, psychology, and now finally in digital or virtual world. And now the most important part, our guest for tonight. Teresa Ruller is one of the two co-founders together with Fit Ruller of the Rodina. The Rodina is an Amsterdam-based post-critical design studio with an experimental practice drenched in strategies of performance art, play, and subversion. The Rodina invents ways in which experience, knowledge, and relations are produced and preserved. In their work, Teresa and Fit explore the spatial and interactive possibilities of virtual environments as a space for new thoughts and aesthetics. The studio specializes in video, user experience, installations, and visual identities. And since 2013, they've worked around the world uh, in all these aspects uh, as, as artists and designers. So I'll start the lecture by Theresa. Hello everyone, welcome to Transformative Collabs. Today, I would like to talk about digital games and how they are being enriched as a medium by artistic practices. I am Teresa Ruler, communication designer, educator and founder of Amsterdam-based studio The Rodina. In our practice, we design situations, participations and interactions be it physical installations, performances and playgrounds, or video games, environmental websites, experiences and tools for life engagement. Playfulness and imagination, they play a key role in designing such projects. Therefore, I would like to look at selected concepts spanning from play as a cultural phenomena, motivational and educational tool to digital games as counter voices to current socio-political situations. So let's dive into games used as emancipatory tools rather than ecstatic escapes. First chapter, from Comenius's Scuola Ludus to video games. During the Great Depression, a Dutch anthropologist, Johan Huizinga, introduced a powerful idea that the condition for culture is a free act of play. But already 280 years before Huizinga's book Homo Ludens, which was released 1938, elaborated the concept of a natural and fundamental need to play. This revolutionary idea was theorized by Czech-born philosopher, ecological thinker and a school reformer John Amos Cominiums, Cominius, Jan Amos Komensky. His book, Orbis Pictus, is the first picture book ever made for children. During the Thirty Year War, a collapsing Middle Age European world order restructuralized during a violent 17th century religious war, which annihilated almost half of the population. Comenius had to flee re catholicized Bohemia to Amsterdam. Death became a safe haven for him as a Protestant. In exile, he developed a philosophy of education and re revolutionized primary schools by integrating play and playtime 
and nature exploration. Comenius saw the play as an important didactic strategy. In his words, the joy and play have the power to open the wisdom gardens. Inspired by his emancipatory work, we've recently developed an educational project called Futuropolis School of Emancipation for the Czech Ministry of Education that engages in critical and creative education by strengthening pupils to question and face current world issues with patience, imagination and courage. Comenius would probably have loved the rich abundance of games and gamification today, even though he encouraged competitiveness in play as part of a learning curve. It is important to note that his vision was more one of a peaceful utopia with enlightened citizens rather than what we have now. Workers, playbearers, consumers performing their visibility in platform capitalism and competing for multiple jobs in the contractless gig economy. In his Scuola Ludus, Comenius introduced a theory of games and healthy competition in relation to learning. Comenius described seven criteria of what makes a game a game. Movement, spontaneity, collective activity, competition, order and rules, facility and imitation, and purpose, as he called it, the relaxation of the soul. This list was later refined during the boom of digital arcade games of the 80s. Making learning fun, publication analyzed digital games to find out what it was in the game design that made them engaging and motivating. It introduced the taxonomy of interesting motivation, which expanded Comenius' and Huizinga's theories. It concluded that Digital games have the ability to motivate players internally by challenge, curiosity, control and choice and fantasy. The key insight is uh, early digital game theory brings human interaction, empathy and imagination to the center. In 1991, motivation and education theories were tested as part of the interactive Pong experiment. A large audience became controlling a tennis player collaboratively, just with a colorful pedals, without any given rules. Much like the deep mind learned how to play Atari games only with the pixel data, controls and scores. So the crowd was able to figure out the situation with no instructions. Second chapter from intoxication to critical world-making, when reality becomes like games. There are 1.65 billion playing digital game users worldwide, which makes a $159 billion industry in 2020. Although nobody knows how many invisible players are simply pirating or borrowing licensed software. As society evolves, from an industrial to informational one, play, playfulness and games have a forming force in human lives. Even though play was for a long time considered childish, most of the digital games of today are designed by adults for adults. This change is ever more accelerated by digital technologies that superimpose the virtual designs on physical such as augmented and virtual reality. These technologies overlay digital information, images and video on the physical world, blending the physical and the virtual worlds together and enhancing our perception and sense of reality. A digital media theorist Alfie Brown Baum writes about the full immersion as a form of intoxication, or you could say Huizinga's vertigo. It is now, via our phones, consoles and computers, that life is really more dreamlike than ever. 
Today, virtuality penetrates both physical space and online experience. The capacity to depict the world in high definition has never been greater. Game developers, as well as artists, manufacture our reality. As tools for game making uh, are increasingly, increasingly accessible to a wider range of creatives, it is essential that the virtual won't be seen as an escapist technology promoted by big game developers, but also reclaimed as a way to mobilize new political imaginary. Like it was in the online multiplayer game Animal Crossing New Horizons, where Hong Kongese protesters customized their islands and used the platform to protest during the pandemic lockdown in spring 2020. Games contain values of people who make them. However, many games still reinforce existing inequalities and appropriate marginalized communities, be it racial, gender, cultural and class biases. The Tropes vs. Women in Video Game, a project by game critique Anita Sarkeshian, is a great example of unpacking unpacking some of the systemic bias problems. The project examines the patterns and stereotypes associated with female characters in gaming. The games we play can affect our sense of self and the ways we relate to the world. For example, works of Rindon Johnson or Larry Achiampong and David Blandy dwell into the politics of race, racism, and they, they challenge the post-colonial issues in digital games. In our game, uh, Poetic Machine Unlearning, the player explores a landscape revealing systemic bias. As an AI engineer, you have to find and fix all the confused, biased and stuck intelligent nodes. Slowly, more sensitivity and reflection are brought into game development. An excellent job of incorporating a character's culture history uh, is game never alone. Folklore and traditions of Inupiat, uh, those are native Alaskan people, are present throughout the game in a respectful way that enriches the player's understanding of these people and their experiences. The third chapter. Fantastical proposals and embodying the kinship. Digital games are important not only because of their cultural ubiquity or their sales figures, but for what they are, what they can offer as a space for imagination and critique. These are significant not only uh, to the game designer, but also for the artist and an indie game developer who rethinks games. For example, Lawrence Lack's fantastical simulated environment, Idol, on a near future and unpack unpacking a complex struggle between humanity and AI. In Playber City Engine's virtual environment, online visitors encounter a live stream mimicking the language of Facebook's famous live multi-layer marketing selling events Barrel parties. Together with Jessica Deira, we perform a bidding event full of mojos, moments of joy. In a playful way, um, we reflect the recent transformation of free play into the gamified play burn, where your work feels like fun while somebody else monetizes and profits with your users' data. Later, all the winning bits are sent to the charity for people in need. Digital worlds are, place, are, digital worlds are, are places for subversion. Games have powerful force in constructing our imagination and desires. Or else the digital dream world will fall into the hands of corporations. Digital games expand the boundaries beyond the realm of pure entertainment. They offer, they offer space for imagination and alternatives to current world order. They educate us about how to live in the midst of the multiple 
swirling crises, ecological climate breakdown, economic recession and uncertainty of COVID-19 pandemic. Kojima's masterpiece, Death Stranding, reflects on the post-disaster post world of life and also death after the ecological catastrophe and mass extinction. A game that invites the player to think about deep ecological time. So, digital media can bear witness to events beyond the scale of our perception and sense of time. The roles we play do not only expose our true realities, but allow us to become somebody else. The subjectivity of role play is therefore an important tool for navigating the perspectives of others. A multi-species tourist, Donna Haraway, offers productive new ways of reconfigure our relations to the Earth and all its inhabitants. Her vision of how human and non-human are inseparably linked could be experienced in a simulation game called Everything. There, on micro and macro levels, the player takes form of any object in the game and is able to interact with other objects, creating unique behaviors. So, everything manifests digital games, are new culture genres helping us to forge the bonds with the other, be it non-human species or the planetary. To conclude, when Comenius reformed education, the Western world and its order were in chaos, agony and collapse. Comparable turbulent times of the Great Depression in between the two world wars shifted, hoising us attention towards play as a cultural phenomenon. Similarly, in the gig economy and precarious conditions of 2008 and 2020 economic crises that repeatedly put down the workforce of millennials, we play with the notion of what a virtual world can offer to players. Such a deep time of reflection and uncertainty led us to experiment with rules, break and subvert them. We are interested in this collapse, or precisely in the lack of rules when the audience takes over and invents their own ways of play. Collapse steers the ground for the new imaginaries. Through the means of role play, their transformative power allows billions of players to understand and feel empathically what is it to be the other. Apart from being motivational and educative, digital games can be a critical genre re reimagining the world differently. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Teresa, for this uh, for this very uh, interesting and also um, visual and complicated talk. Uh, and luckily, uh, I can ask you all everything about it. So um, again, thank you. Uh, and I had uh, I'll just dive in <laughs> with the questions. Um, in your lecture, you contrast uh, Comenius' utopia, uh, so the Czech humanist uh, and uh, Protestant, I guess, uh, with the real world of, I quote, workers, laborers, consumers, performing their visibility in platform capitalism and competing for multiple jobs in the contractless gig economy. Um, so I feel this is a, bit a, description, a, a somber description of the world we're in at the moment, but maybe you could explain a little bit the terms you use, because I have the feeling they're very uh, important for the rest of your story. So what do you mean with these terms like workers, labor, labors, consumers, or platform capitalism, and also contractless gig economy? So we should sure start maybe yeah thank you so much for having me uh inviting me for these uh, more philosophical lectures i think it's quite exciting as a visual designer to take part in this series it's it's great to be here thank you so labor and laborers i came upon um this turn which was actually coined in 2005 um uh, by other philosopher which i just forgot <laughs> no um then um i was really 
looking at how actually fun and play are being transformed um, by, uh, by the, let's say, not just the game industry, but more by platforms we use on daily basis, like Facebook and Instagram, into basically taking our users' work as as users and our free time and transforming that kind of playful activity into monetizing upon this time we give them or the data we share. So somehow I felt, um, I started to research that in 2014, uh, 15, that these boundaries between play and production are melting and uh, also boundaries between what's work and what's leisure time as well. They're kind of blurry. And, and also consumption and production, because at the same time, and especially on social uh, media, we are somehow consuming content that others are making and the uh, ads and advertising that's there in a pleasurable way. Uh, but as well, we're kind of contributing to these platforms. We are making the content and we are making the work for them as well. So I felt this is really strange phenomena and I wanted to dive into that. So most of my, most of my uh, projects when I can do what I want uh, are around the topic uh, feeling or expressions around uh, what the playbur is, uh, what, what does it mean to be the playbur, the worker in this visual industry that produces a lot of images. Yeah. Yeah, elsewhere you called it, I think, uh, this personal data that's being mined, like the new oil of the of the new this new digital era. Um, would you say that um, transforming it into your own work is it is it a way of uh, uh, raising awareness, or what what would you like to do with it with this information? For I was interested also in the in the work of designers themselves of us. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to contribute to this economy? And we can call it, we're part of the platform capitalism or we are part of, we are the workers in the gig economy. And the gig is I think taken mostly from music industry, the inspiration that you're running your gigs, you have show and show and another show. But for us as cre uh, creatives, it means mostly that we're asked to be flexible and we don't have really full big contracts. We are not really employees of, of any company. We are more kind of this kind of flexible workers running from one job to another. So that's also described, like that also contains a lot of uncertainty in, in these, and especially in these days that you don't know what, you, what will you do next year or in few months, this kind of strange thing that you also have to pay your own taxes, your own security insurance, you have to save up for your own pension. Uh, there is basically no uh, structure that could really, uh, that you would feel that you, you would be supported by. You cannot form unions that easily because uh, if you're not employed, it's, uh, yeah, where do you, who do you meet? Uh, where do you go? Um, so somehow be independent, there is this, double-sided coin of, of being independent creative. Um, and I want to express this feeling because of course I love to be a designer, but also there is this other side of, okay, where does this go? Because mostly be an artist or designer could be also considered, oh, you like to do it. So you might even do it for your visibility for zero on the platforms, on the Instagram, make Instagram stories for free, make this and that. So makes me wonder and question. <laughs> okay, yeah. So maybe um, we're all part of this either, uh, and, and you already said it very uh, um, clearly, like play and production is, is merging, consuming and producing is merging. But to take a step back, uh, the games you describe are all in the virtual realm. Uh, but even the virtual cannot exist without the material. So hardware, internet accessibility, surfers, glass fiber cables, precious metals, if you go like all the way to in the chain of production. How does this aspect of the digital world uh, interfere in the relation between the virtual and the physical? Uh, and especially if, as you propose this idea of games as an emancipatory tool. Mm -hmm. I think one one thing just, that, that just pops out when you mention also the, the wires and the cables is also um, just good to mention 
responsibility towards actually designing and making things to contributing to the world of games or design because everything you do even though it's just virtual and it seems very much not physical it takes the data they have physical representation uh, all the servers that run on on clear water and, and and the energy they need all these physical resources from the ground from earth from the upper layer upper crust of, of our own planet so I think that just, uh, I haven't thought about it before, but when you mention it now, it really sparkles um, this idea to be responsive, responsible towards the, the environment we are at. And then as emancipatory tool, I was thinking that it's just like I mentioned it there in the talk that, that uh, the access to all technologies is just increasing. We have like this year, we have 3 billion uh, users of smartphones and through those, of course, there's so much uh, augmented reality apps and tools and, and um, things you can, and games you can play. So I think there, it, it's a question of accessibility for players, but how we can make these players emancipated that they start making their own tools. And that's where I'm really starting to be interested that you can you know, mess with the rules of some games, change the scenarios or change the maps maybe change the textures and then you can start thinking how can you develop your own game and i think there are wonderful game engines like uh, uh, i think unreal and unity that if you know a little bit of yeah, if you work with computer and and you might take um, you know you can look at some tutorials which is also nice that there's a huge community then uh, you can actually grow and become your own developer and tool shaper so that's exciting. That's yeah, right. I have a question that ties very nicely um, um, into this. Uh, you, in your talk, you give the example of the Pong experiment, an experiment in which a group of people is giving this game um, without instructions, and yet they could figure out collectively how, how it worked and play it. Uh, could you maybe tell us somewhat more about the importance of uh, rules in digital games and not only like what rules are made by the game maker and which rules are inherent to the digital form maybe so you already talked a little bit about almost giving the means of production to the player more than the the maker of the game but how would this does this difference matter between um uh, what is inherent to the digital form and what are the rules made by the game maker mm -hmm. I think with the, um, I think it's mostly like question on the game mechanics and uh, affordances that we can or possibilities that different games can can give us. So if you have like the table games or the or board games, they would have different possibilities than games role play or that you can play outside on the playground as a kid and definitely different than using technologies. I don't know what, I haven't thought about exact examples of, of these new mechanics that are brought by uh, virtual worlds or, or these games, but it's definitely a means of maybe embodiments that you can, uh, of course, you're using your, uh, the role play as one of the, so you have your characters, your avatars, but in these, uh, in these virtual worlds, these avatars already look somehow. So there is already a visual layer um, of these avatars, which can be done, maybe customized by you as a player or by uh, game designers, developers. I was quite interested in the mechanics itself because it brings like a lot of interesting questions for when you are developing your own game, whether you want people to collect action points or solve puzzles or race against each other or more build something together. So there's all these questions that you have to kind of think about when you're making when you're making game and I think um, somehow it's connected maybe also with the how also games virtual video games um, have developed because in video games the processing power of computers has really much increased so you can do much more if you imagine like the old game of like space invaders or I don't know asteroids something you've played maybe I don't know MS-DOS or even before like Atari uh, then uh, it was just about the game mechanics was like to collect things or to shoot things and the game scenario the world was very much limited and you had the levels but now uh, it's extremely complex like huge open scenario mass multiplayer worlds where you can really join in like the Fortnite 
uh, the Battle Royale or, or the World of Warcraft. So those are huge worlds you can really explore or Elder Scrolls and you can play it at home even and, and be connected with many players abroad. So it's just like you have more affordances, more possibilities what to do. It's just yeah, quite exciting. Okay. You give also one example of a game that is maybe used for totally different uses than, than the makers uh, had had in mind. Uh, you, you give the example of the uh, game used by Hong Kongese um, protesters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm looking for the name of it. Oh, yeah, that's Animal Crossing. Um, yeah, could you tell us something island. about how this game is used for all these totally different... Yeah, or... it's quite... Uh... It was quite exciting to uh, found out that was, I think this spring that I realized this happened uh, because of course the protests for democracy in, in Hong Kong and the protesters, they couldn't really meet because of Corona, they couldn't gather. And of course the police uh, oppression was very much present. So they needed to figure out some alternatives for gatherings, but also really showing to the world that they're still holding the flags of democracy. And, and this animal crossing is, I don't want to label it, but it's very simple um, leisure time. Too cute, too cute for me to even play it. Like uh, it's ridiculously <laughs> cute game that you just almost do nothing. You just help your friends to build and live on an island. It's just, yeah, there's almost like for me, the game mechanics, yeah, it's like far away from what I would be interested. It's basically killing the time. It's like doing nothing almost. And they use this space to put on their textures the banners for protest so they really took over this space which was before claimed they are not interested in politics and they will they will not um, uh, do any censorship so uh, yeah they took they took over this space which so, and who are they then in this the the people who exp who make the game available or the server no, that was like uh, parts of the umbrella protest the uh, joshua wong and and his yeah, yeah i understand but who, who was who who gave them actually the opportunity by saying that they were apolitical the makers of the game or the, ones the makers of the game oh, said right. that it's like non-advertising environment and uh, unpolitical so that's why they will not censor things and it wasn't, I think, explicitly really said before to invite protesters. It mm -hmm. was just part of the rules of the game. And um, they just imported their own textures, which is, which is allowed. But normal people, they put textures of their pets or of their, yeah, of their, of their mom or something they put there. But <laughs> they just so they bend the rules for their own uses. Um... Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe um, to also uh, ask something about the figure you introduced or, or the historical person of uh, uh, Comenius who um, developed his ideas about play and especially children's play mm -hmm. after um, fleeing for the 30 year war. Uh, and you also mentioned that Huizinga uh, wrote Homo Ludens during the Great Depression. And I think it's mm -hmm. very funny you were the first who called it the Great Depression because everyone mentioned that it is before Second World War, but you um, connected it clearly to this economical crisis. Um, do you see a connection between how these diff uh, different uh, writers use the play element or uh, explore the play element in times of crisis? I know because we in the studio we really like to work uh, with not with crisis, but uh, you know with this positive means of being a little bit stressed and a little bit pushed to do things or or also seeing that our work is being used in a little bit different manner that people take over and they find their own rules or you know they read in between lines and become become creative in ways we don't expect and that way i also looked at i thought that oh how come that they thought about play and childhood so much and i think it was very much similar also to dada movement how they actually protested after the war after the second world war after first world war and how they felt how they felt the crisis of basically of what does it mean to be human with such so much violence and cruelty they 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 seen in the war so i thought this is very much connected how dada started and i thought okay there wasn't just like First World War and Second World War, the time in between was longer and you cannot easily say when it started, but it was crisis that really creeped into people's life 
same as the 30 uh, years long uh, war in Europe, which also creeped into people's life throughout multiple, multiple horrible events. So it wasn't just like one date, you could say, but it was slower and it was there. Somehow it feels very much similar if I compare the, the crisis today. I mean, we have ecological climate breakdown going on, but we just like don't, we pay attention to it, but there's so many other crises, the economical one and also the health one. We have many uprisings all over the world. Like now we, there's, there's new wars popping up around. So you also feel oh, how come, what, what is this time we, we're living at? Uh, is this also in between things? How this will be framed in the future? I'm quite curious about that slow increasing, um, where does it go? Yeah. So would you even say maybe that there's always somewhere a crisis on the background? <laughs> Yeah, and maybe more also for creative people, the cri crisis uh, spark also new ideas or try to find new ways how to deal with the world and with life. So, yeah. yeah. So maybe I'm, I'm a bit uh, less utilitarian. You give um, several examples of games for educational purposes and games mm -hmm. for uh, emancipatory aims um, mm -hmm. and even rather emancipatory than uh, aesthetic escapist, as you call it. Uh, do you think that games always need to have some use that they um, is there also space for just useless games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to have all didactic games or uh, beautiful games. I think there are some games that just bring the leisure so so you feel free again. Uh, yeah, you somehow use it for your free time. But I also come up on like a ridiculous game about this goose. I think it's like new favorite game. It just was just released recently. And that's like very annoying goose that just walks around and uh, bites people and destroys destroys things around. And you play the goose and you're just like, yeah, there is like nicely organized village and you're trying to just, uh, you know, bite it into everything. And uh, so this <laughs> just ridiculously, again, cute game that actually doesn't really harm, but you're just this annoying animal. and. <laughs> So yeah, you can you can uh, you can live uh, with these games where actually you don't have to make protests or you don't have to make strategic worlds and new special worlds. You can also just feel free to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that uh, these digital games do what you call so beautiful, or, or Comenius calls so beautiful, the relaxation of the soul? Is that also pro possible yeah. in this digital realm? Yeah, yeah, but I have to say for me as creator somehow brings always these topics of society and change and the future of the world is, is not relaxing, but somehow it gives me like hope when I will tackle these topics uh, that it will bring some future relaxation of the soul. So it really depends what kind of person you are. If you just want to forget about the world or if you want to try to yeah, steer some uh, wheels in that direction. <laughs> Yeah, so for everyone, it's something else, this yeah. relaxation or yeah. a, a game even. Yeah, and it's so broad. The virtual worlds now are so broad and there's so many options, so many games, many engines you can work with. So I think we have opportunities to really explore our individual uh, pleasures, let's say, or joys or, or fears. I mean, yeah, it depends. <laughs> There's also a question uh, from Alina and she wants to ask him herself. Maybe this is the right time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ask. Sure, yeah. ask me questions. Uh, hi, Teresa. Uh, thank you for your talk and your explanation. I thought it was really interesting and I was really uh, reminiscing about all of the games I used to play. Uh, what have you played? <laughs> uh, well, I wasn't really that gamey, but I was uh, really into Second Life, for example. Oh, um, yeah. and all of the games where I was like a god figure, uh, making theme parks, for example. Ingress, I was a huge Ingress fan. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. And that were really games that engaged me and made me really active. And the, the, the sad thing is now I play games while I am listening to podcasts because oh. it's but really uh, mindless games so that I can keep being focused on the podcast. Uh -huh, <laughs> it's really uh -huh. a strange function. Uh, and I play, yeah, Matchington Mansion. It's a really bad app game. Uh -huh. 
Um, but the, the question I actually wanted to ask is, um, I, I, I was wondering, um, the, the games with a political dimension, it's really interesting to, to hear about those because I think 10 or 15 years ago, they weren't really around or I, I didn't know them in any case. Uh, and I was wondering um, if, if they really, um, 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 if they correspond with, with uh, act the actual events, uh, I, I suppose so. Um, and also as a maker, um, I suppose that you might feel some responsibility to tackle issues like that. But then again, maybe it takes away some of the playfulness you, you have as a maker. So I was wondering how you, uh, how you manage that? I mean, I still feel playful within that. Uh, um, I mean, for example, last time uh, we did this, um, I think I mentioned in the lecture, but in the Playboy City Engines with Jessica Deira, we did this peril show and um, a transaction party that was inspired by Facebook's peril shows. And it was a lot of fun for us, but of course, before we started the live streaming in this virtual world, we decided if we really get some money from bidding because it was all about bidding and people could really send us money with PayPal and buy some uh, future playgrounds from us that we have to actually sculpt ne next month. <laughs> but, um, but then we thought, okay, this, if we really raise some money from people through this game world, we will dedicate it to some funds. So then it was a lot of fun and later then we just use it and we supported the, the trans queer uh, black uh, Dutch movement, the Netherlands. So we sent it there and we felt, yeah, this, this, this had a meaning and we sent also half to fund of single mothers because in crisis, in Corona crisis, and especially in uh, Eastern Europe, they're falling in between two chairs. They're not being supported by state enough. So they really don't have money. So we thought, yeah, we will send it there and it will, at least there will be some little gesture, which is not a lot of money, but I have examples from um, more indie industry. So the indie games, how was it called? So I have here maybe, um, each IO, each IO, and this is like indie marketplace and they gathered like a lot of games that you could buy for really little money. And they raised a lot of money for for the uh, for Black Lives Matter, so for racial justice. And this was just the indie market that just did it, and they raised until the end, I think, eight millions. So it was quite a lot for for different community bail funds and and things in states. So I think these games they react often, or the game world reacts often later after things happen. So it's not really beforehand, but then there are examples of many artists who are actually active and asking about, for example, queer spaces and what does it mean to be, you know, to not fall into the norms of what is uh, about sexuality and, and about gender and, and these, they are investigating these norms already beforehand and now when things happen or, or um, then they become maybe more famous, so there's Jacob Bissatter White, or I mentioned Ridden Johnson, or Larry Achiampong and David Blandy. So those are amazing artists, I would say, game developers and artists who are mentioning these problems already before. But uh, yeah, I don't know whether I answered your question. <laughs> I got a little bit like, uh, yeah, with all these games. No, but yes. these artists are amazing because they do it before. It's just like we have to wait for events to happen and then we can see that this was already topic for quite some time and for many years already. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. answered the question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, to uh, also continue on that, you also write that um, games have a powerful force in constructing our imagination and desires. Mm -hmm else the digital dream world will fall into the hands of the corporations could you maybe tell us some more about this how, how to be uh, how to prevent that actually or uh, how, how does that work yeah i don't know it would be also great that the bigger companies who make games would actually you know uh kind of seize the chance to demonstrate that they also have some solidarity that would be amazing that the big game industry i talk about the big I don't know, Nintendo and, and the huge ones, the corporations would also do a bit more 
before things happen. So they would really, uh, you know, for example, with the Black Lives Matter, that there will be already some CEOs or there will be already people leading the industry, uh, you know, like uh, people, indigenous people, people of color. But it just takes so long and people have to complain and protest or even lives are being taken for this before the before the industry is just makes little steps. It's just so easy to give few contracts in such a huge companies to people who should represent and or be represented and be there. Yeah. You do give a few few helpful examples also, uh, luckily. Um, I was also wondering a, a very a more small question. How did you self start as a player of, of digital games? I just I just played, I think same as Aline, I just played uh, already as a little kid, I think on MS-DOS. I really don't know how I would right now, if you would open MS-DOS, how I would like go somewhere because it was without mouse and cursor, <laughs> but I somehow did it. Uh, I think I played like old games like Prince of Persia and then later uh, I played like more the shooting action games like Doom or the Quake and, and Counter-Strike. And then later there were all the strategies, so it was more complex, you had to build the worlds like Tycoon, I think you mentioned, or the hospital or Sims, but then also, I don't know, Age of Empires, and that actually is big passion, so it stayed with me. Um, I still like to sometimes play Age of Empires, it kind of reminds me Christmas time, you know, when you see your favorite fairy tale on TV, and a game of, of these games, they remind me kind of, oh, it's like holiday time, it's special time. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think sometimes it makes it hard to, um, so there is this entire virtual world which is very present and very influential, but at the same time it's very generationally bound, so do you feel that there is quite a big, yeah, like, um, divide between generations because these worlds are so separate? I think now more and more generations find themselves in games, also maybe the older generation with the tools are so accessible or the games and apps. But of course, it's easy to catch them uh, uh, on, on games that are, you know, just uh, the Facebook games, the easy one that just mine your data, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you collect the colorful stones and they're popping out. It's just like, uh, yeah, I don't know how it's even called, but, you know, these are the most addictive games. They claim themselves they're puzzle games, but there are no puzzles. It's just like, it takes your time. It's like, takes out your productivity and then you feel guilty you play these games especially in office, like it used to be this old card game Solitaire, I think, mm -hmm. or Finding the Mines, I don't know what was that, in the old Windows. And now it's all these uh, procrastination games online. That's more for, that. that's what I see when I see uh, people playing these games, then I see playing these games. When I look over the shoulder a little bit in the Metro or something, then I see them doing this. <laughs> But yeah, I think we have more common language these days and especially like Gen Z and millennials, we can find like our, our games, I think. Okay. Um, and um, so we talked a little bit about uh, crises before and now with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, of course, the, like the digital space has become even more important, even faster, like it accelerated, even also in uh, like educational context, for example. Mm -hmm. Could you tell something about this and how this influences the work of, of your studio? Yeah, I mean, we were preparing for making more and more virtual games before. So with the coding, you need quite some coding skills, which I really don't have. It's more really, uh, it's more Vit side. Uh, he's expert in that. Uh, and, and the free building 3D world. So kind of this shift that happened really fastly in spring, we felt it's ready for us to just help others, the institutions that they needed to create virtual exhibitions because the physical ones were canceled or postponed till never ending date. So we could really help them in a short time to build virtual show. But then somehow it also became exciting for us. We also want to have our own show. So we try to think about this, the means of building our own or helping others just with like different types of streaming but then actually, oh, how it would, would it be that we try to stream ourselves and, and try these things? But of course, it's always difficult with, these, with streaming, for example, how much you want to become this uh, 
consumer, producer, playbearer, how much you give yourself to platforms like Twitch or YouTube or Facebook again. So that's why we thought it could be quite interesting during this pandemic to stream only inside the virtual worlds that we make architecture of. So inside our worlds without, without the streaming platforms. So that was quite exciting. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so this part was somehow smoother than we expected, but we were when a lot of installations and like um, some shows that we have planned were canceled or, you know, needed to be just postponed. We thought, oh, what do we do? Because we are so uncertain. We actually have booked the time for exhibition and now there is nothing is this emptiness. But then, you know, after a few months, these projects can also dangerously like pile up. Right, because you don't have the deadline and suddenly everybody wants to when when the when the pandemics not ends, but when the social distancing uh, gets less. Um, how do you call it like uh, problematic, <laughs> then everybody wants to make these shows again and that would pile up projects and it's you cannot handle it as a small studio of two people so then we thought. Let's try to shift it into the virtual spaces so we can we can have the work going on. So yeah. So you even shifted more to the virtual space uh, yeah. than before. Like everyone did. Before, most of the video games that we made were really like video games. So we used Engine Unity and we would sculpt it in 3D. And that's galleries, uh, museums, they would have computer in there and you could play it on console. But now we thought you cannot really come to museum, to galleries, they're closed. So uh, we need websites. So the game, the games that we started making was just because of pandemics. Yeah. So the, the institutions in between have been cut out of the communication actually between yeah. you and the audience. Yeah, but that actually brings a lot of new problems because you are used to there is technician, like person who helps you to build it. Uh, if you need to make some nice, I don't know, wall wall paintings or or wallpapers there is production company that prints it for you installs it for you but suddenly if you make the game you have to make the lights you have to make the everything you have to build yourself you have to sculpt it yourself you also have to take care of opening hours or like letting visitors in so you have to test how many people you can have at the same time which is suddenly like all of the jobs are connected into being a, being this kind of experimentator. Yeah, it's funny, even the virtual realm has opening hours uh, and you, you have to be both the supposed and the maker yeah. and the painter and everything. Yeah. 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 Um, I have made a, a, a last question. You did answer it throughout your conversation, but I, I ask it anyway. Um, so in the introduction for this series, uh, the philosopher Elisa de Mul writes in her introduction that Huizinga notices an alarming erosion of uh, game playing in his own time. And he, for him, it comes because of economic interest, technological development and individualization of society. Yeah. So everyone doing everything on, its, on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and because the game loses its aspect of uh, disinterestedness or um, being a means without an end um, and he fears that the erosion of the game element is also the end of culture so for you do you recognize somewhat of his pessimism concerning culture uh, and in your case of course more specific digital culture or are you a, a real optimist and that, do you not recognize anything of this i hope to be more optimistic in that, uh, in, in emancipation of the tools we have as creators and players. But somehow I recognize when he, he mentions that, I would more say for us, the fear is this uh, is more instrumentalization. So that the, the players or the users are turned into workers. So that's more going back to the, the platform capitalism and labor itself that we are being instrumentalized or objectified as, as means of resources, ourselves, our data, our lives, our time, our playing time. So that's something I'm more um, afraid of than uh, what he was at that time. Mm -hmm. So it somehow developed. I think he was very much right, but somehow it shifted towards this instrumentalization. Oops. And could you maybe, um, I, I don't know, maybe this is too big a question, but could you give one way for us as, um, 
players to uh, stay players without becoming either workers or consumers in, in this digital realm? I think it's, uh, I'm struggling with that myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people often ask about, uh, so how do you do with Instagram if you criticize it so much? Uh, yeah, you can still find me on there. So it's like, it's very problematic. Mm -hmm. I think it's more about trying to be more like players, hackers in, in a good sense, in creative sense that you try to understand the tools or the games themselves or the mechanics of them and try to dissect them or analyze them and use them for your own um, own things in your own life somehow or play play with them in a, in a way that it wasn't maybe designed for and expected um, that you will do that and take over yeah Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Teresa Ruler. So uh, we have to use game for others, play them in another way than they're maybe made. Yeah, um, yeah. experiment to break the rules, and I think that could be interesting. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much, Fip. Thank you too. Yeah, I will close a little uh, bit. I'm I'm looking for my um, instructions. So. Um, Thank you also visitors for your um, attention and, and your visit tonight. Dit is de laatste avond in deze serie, maar de buren heeft natuurlijk nog talloze andere activiteiten online en live. Mocht u geïnteresseerd zijn in de voorgaande avonden uit deze reeks met theatermaker Laura van Dolrum, politicoloog Anton Jäger en psychotherapeut en filosoof Jens de Vleming, dan kunt u, binnen, kunt u die binnenkort terugkijken via de website van de buren. Voor nu een hele fijne avond en dank voor uw aandacht.